Hello again. Hey, I, I have another announcement for you. Jesus Christ is Lord. Yeah, who is Jesus to you? Let's say it. One, two, three, ready? One, two, three. Yeah, he's the son of God who's been sent as the lamb to come and take away the sins of the world through his sacrifice on the cross to prove God's power through being risen from the dead on the third day. All good news. And that's where we are in the gospel of Mark, right? It starts out the beginning of the good news. And as we go through the next few weeks, we'll finish the gospel of Mark, but we will not end the good news, for it is still going on today. And I pray for that and for the stories that you share uh, along the way. So open up, we'll be in Mark chapter 12 today is where we'll be. And really what's happening at this point, Jesus is in Jerusalem, remember, he rode in there in Uh, then showed his authority, displayed it there in the temple, uh, displayed it over the fig tree. And so then Jesus is about to answer some questions, and his qualification to answer those questions has been firmly established by Mark's scriptural background up to this moment, whether it be the healings that were miraculous, the exorcism of demons, the authority over God's creation, the wind and the waves, all of that has been done. Jesus' authority in caring for people in a greater way than even the civic rule of Rome had been displayed as well. So well, that's, that's all been there for us. So in this chapter, there's a few questions that get asked of Jesus, and he gives them answer. Now, I had a lawyer tell me once, and, and I, I worked in a courthouse, not a lawyer, don't claim to be, have an expert, watched a few TV shows, that's about it. But I, I heard it said that really it's very important that you never ask a question for which you don't know the answer in court, Right? Well, obviously, those legal analysts and scribes, those Pharisees and Sadducees we encounter in this text today, that prided themselves on on being good handlers of, of the Word of God, the law, as it was for them, asked questions they didn't know the answer they would get. They knew what answer they hoped they would get, but Jesus answered them in a better way. Now, The chapter starts off with a parable. And remember why Jesus chose parables? It's because people didn't listen to the truth. And he also told the parables and didn't explain them to those that were the religionists because, well, it's not that he didn't love them and didn't want them to get the truth. He just knew that they wouldn't. And Jesus then tells this story at the very beginning of the chapter that tells about a man who has a vineyard, gets it all ready, the best vineyard that is, leaves some guys in charge and sends people to check on it. And and all those who come to visit and to check on the place, they beat and turn away. Finally, he says, I'll send my son. And then the son is coming. They say, hey, great, if we kill the son, if we just kill the son, then we'll get all this for ourselves. Instead of being caretakers, we'll be commanders of it. And the way the the parable ends is Jesus made uh, the the people there in religious leadership change their minds. No! They were mad. They already wanted to kill him. Now they're incensed and ready to kill him. That's the way that ends. And into that text, then Jesus speaks this one little line, a quote there that comes from Scripture, where he says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now, you may be familiar with what's happening there. Jesus is saying something they would understand, we might not understand. But when the the people returned back from exile several centuries before this time, Jerusalem had been leveled, the temple had been torn down, the walls were a shambles. What had happened is people had picked through and you know, stones that were already, you know, cut well by stonemasons that they could use. They had built their own houses. And all that was really left was just a heap of the the leftover rejected stones. And so when they rebuilt the wall, rebuilt the temple, that's all they had to work with. And from that, built a glorious place of worship. And Jesus is saying, 
to these guys, you're rejecting the stones that are going to be the place of the living work and word of God. Today, let's listen well to the answers of Christ. Not that they would fit into our expectation, but that they would truly be the message that our hearts need desperately to hear. Bow with me. God, your Holy Spirit is here. We've been praising you. You are aware of our, our tiny moment here gathered in this place, this, this little speck, uh, God, of all of your glorious creation. You are, you are as focused on what is happening here as you are everywhere. And that means intently. And so, God, our, our purpose is not to get you to listen to us, but we pray we can listen to you. God, I pray this could be one of those sermons that though, even though I, I, I have tried to pray and to listen and study, and I feel like I've got these things that you want shared from the text, that, that there would even be those that today, because of the powerful work of your Holy Spirit, would be able to say to one another, or even to me, those words really helped me with something that wasn't even where I knew it needed to go. And it would give evidence that you are the one speaking. Thank you, God that that does happen and will happen because of the gift of your spirit, the truth of your word, and the presence of your people. In Christ's name, we all said amen. Um, I've got a, a few excerpts here from things in the chapter. Uh, the, the, again, those uh, Pharisees and Herodians, they were ticked off, right? And, and I get a little bit of that. I mean, there have been times over the nearly four decades of pastoring, I've said something in a sermon or in a Bible study that was really truth from the Word of God that people didn't want to hear, right? And, and that's, that happens sometimes. Not, not because you're just trying to make somebody mad, but sometimes the Word of God offends us. I mean, and it needs to, right? I mean, when, when you're driving along in your vehicle or truck and, and you're not paying attention and you, you are going down the road and all of a sudden you hit those little like bumps that are on the side of the road, I call those driving by braille, by the way. Um, and so you're, and they, they kind of shock you, they annoy you, they are loud, they are meant to save your life and the lives of others. They say, hey, pay attention. You don't get to choose where to go down the road. You can't, you can't magically make pavement around here. It's already been done for you. Stay on the track. And Jesus' arrival is calling his people back to the path, the way, the truth, and the life. So they send some to try to catch him in his words. For really smart people, they're slow on the uptake, aren't they? And they say, look, we, we know, Jesus, you're, you're true, you're, you get it all, you're exactly right. And they pull out that, this thing, this is that text that often gets used by preachers at tax time to tell you it's okay to pay taxes. That's really not what this is about. It's also not about uh, how you handle your money to make sure that, um, that it helps you know, go in the offering plate at church. That's not what that's about either. That, that comes up later in the chapter where the woman that gives all that she has is actually more valuable for the kingdom of God than those who want people to see whatever it is they give. You see that? That, that happens later. So what's happening here really is a decision about responsibility. And so we'll get into that in a bit. But again, Jesus uh, has them come to them and say, is it okay for us to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now, there was coinage for the temple, the drachma, and then there was the denarii, the Roman uh, uh, coin that was there that you would use to pay that. There was a temple tax that was paid in order to come in and worship at the temple. Yeah, that's right. You had to pay it on the way in, not on the way out back then. 
uh, but you, they paid on the way in. And so there's, they're kind of trying to trip Jesus up and saying, look, we're not going to ask you if it's okay to pay the temple tax that allows us to have these fine uh, buildings and, and nice robes that he talks about later. But we want, we want you to get you in trouble talking about, about the Romans. And Jesus knows their hypocrisy. And he says, why are you trying to trap me? Bring me the denarius. Let me see it. And he looks at it and he says, whose is this? Whose is on it? It's got a picture of, of Caesar. And y'all know what comes next. Jesus says, then, then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. It's got his name on it. Everything you're getting to do because of this Roman peace, the Pa Romana that, that existed at that time there, is because of the authority of Rome that's over them. And so he says, then, then give that back to Caesar. But let me tell you this. And give to God what is God's. Now, last time I checked in God's creation, the Magio Dei, the image of God, was put upon male and female, this human creation. This, and, and all that, that means, that's a whole other sermon series, by the way, that we'll work on. But this fact that we, we bear the image of God. Not for our pride, but for our purpose. And it's one thing to give back the tax to the authorities of the civic reign, but it's a far worse thing to withhold all that truly bears the image of God from his work among us. Now, the Roman coin could be used to purchase things in the Roman place, and the the temple tax could be used to get your access into the temple to, to worship and to sacrifice and those things that needed to be done there. But only one thing have we to offer God. And that is us. Not out of pride, but out of just as we are and say, Lord, we surrender all. All that I am is yours. And so we give him that. Jesus says, give back to him. And so they hear that answer and they are amazed. The next story is about the Sadducees that are there. And again, the text tells us the Sadducees don't even believe there is a resurrection. And they ask him a question about the resurrection. They look back at what's called the Leveret marriage law and, and says, which is this idea that they talk about if, if a guy marries a wife and he takes a wife to himself, that uh, if, if there's not an heir, it's because of how business was done back then, family businesses happened, that, that they would, you know, that if she didn't leave an heir for the elder brother, the next brother in line would take her as a wife. Got it? And so that's kind of how that goes. So then that brother dies, they say, then the next brother dies, and finally the third with no children, then the woman dies. And verse 23 says then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? And Jesus then answers, you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, a, a quick aside about that. This is more than just about will you know your spouse when you get to heaven, right? I want you to know that. This is more, more than that. Because, you know, heaven is not just for married people. I want you to know that. That's not, Jesus is not just answering that question. He's not saying that's how this works. He's saying, he, he actually really kind of does it. He says, look, he says, you don't really know the word of God or the power of God. And he goes on in the 26th verse. He says, now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It's quite clear in the text. He's saying, that's what's really happening now. I, I still am their God. It's an ongoing thing. It's not in the past. It's present, future. It is happening. I am and will be their God. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Do you see that? This isn't about the death. And so I'll lean into that in just a little bit. But what, what really is being said there is that 
that these relationships that we have transcend the, even the best of the human bonds that we attach them to. The last question comes from a teacher of the law, beginning in verse 28. It says, one of the teachers of the law came, heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus says, going back to the Shema, the blessing there. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Now, at that time, there were hundreds of additional commandments on top of the Ten Commandments of God. They were so confounding and confusing. Even to this day, there is Jewish legalism that has, has twisted and contorted and found loopholes and different ways to exist inside the Mosaic Law without, without breaking them while keeping the letter of the law that, that happens. And it was a whole thing that happened. But Jesus then pairs it down. This guy just wanted the one that was most important so he could kind of go on his way and, and be able to say, hey, this is the one the rabbi give me, but they gave me. But the other thing that was really happening here was he could say, hey, Jesus said this law is the most important. So all of you people that think these other laws are important, he doesn't like you. He's not on your side. Do you see what he's doing? He's trying to polarize and anger and be able to stir up more people in this campaign to kill this rabbi from Nazareth. That's what's happening there. But Jesus then instead brings it right in and says, look, says that, but the guy then hears this answer and something switches in his mind. He says, well said. He says, you're right in saying there, that God is one, there's no other but him, love him with all your heart and all your understanding, all your strength, love your neighbor and self, is self is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus heard that he'd answered wisely, and he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You hear him saying? He's like, you're almost there. It's kind of like when you've got that big bass on, on the hook, right? And you can tell it's huge, and you see it jump, but you don't have it out of the water yet, right? That's what Jesus is saying. Come on in. But then what happens is nobody dares ask him a question after that. Now, just to recap, when Jesus went to Jerusalem before this account, when he got there, when he rode in on, on the donkey, there was that eastern gate. There's an image of it on the screen. It was one built just really several hundred years ago. That's not the original one. And, and so it was bricked up uh, by the the Saracen ruler that was there at the time because he heard among the Jews and the Christians that their Lord was going to come riding in through that gate that day, one day. So he said, I'll fix that. We'll just brick it up where he can't get in. That's why it looks like that today in that eastern gate. But Jesus has already ridden in, folks. That's the good news. He's already, already taken that city, and now we carry him into the world. But the gate was open then, but their minds were just as bricked up and closed about what God could do as that is today. And so the, Jesus is given this exam in these things that he aces, right? He blows it out of the top. He, he leaves no room for a curve in his answers. And the first question really is about who is in charge, and it's an answer about responsibility. Uh, Christian discipleship is not a zero-sum game. We don't choose to follow Christ, meaning that we give him all that we have and then abandon any other accountability or responsibility that we have. In fact, it actually enhances that. For those that were following Christ, the encouragement was in that day to become the best citizens that could possibly be. Paul writes in Romans 13, in the midst of a terrible, tyrannical, and corrupt government that Rome had, to remember that they have that sword for a reason to keep the peace. And so Jesus doesn't call one who is devoted to him to abandon present life, but engage in it with an eternal view. We have this awesome opportunity to exist obediently in which, inside the structures in which we find ourselves. We don't get to sit in the classroom as a teenager and say, I don't have to listen to the teacher because I'm free in Christ. We don't get to do that. 
right? We don't get that opportunity. We don't get to be the one that says, I don't, I don't have to be obedient to my boss. I don't have to be a, a surrendering person as a husband. I don't have to care more about my wife than myself because I'm free in Christ. No, we, we find ourselves in all of those things and saying, I will be a, a one who surrenders and, and loves my wife as Christ loved the church. Paul writes about that in Ephesians. We're called to this understanding that we are eternally bound, but still the best thing that we could be upon this earth. It ought to be practice for heaven in all of our relationships and responsibilities. It means we're the best at paying our bills. We're the best at trying to drive the speed limit. Did I get somebody on that one? We're the best at obeying all the things that are around us and all of our responsibilities. We ought to be known as the best ones that live them out. The people around us ought to look at Christians and say, whoa, they are the best citizens around us. They're the, the, best, at, the best at their business, the best at their merchant, the best at their offerings. They, their word is their bond. We have that responsibility and the reason we do so is because we have an eternal worldview, right? It's not worth cutting the corners because every corner you cut doesn't last, but everything done straight for the cause of Christ lasts forever. The, the next question is a question about what will heaven be like? And I said I would come back to this, and it's an answer Jesus gives about the resurrection. I've, I've led a lot of funerals, and a few of them through the years, sadly, have been among people who had no faith in the resurrection, like none at all, uh, when I would meet with the family. They just were doing it because it was what you do, and they wanted, they wanted a preacher to do it. It was very hard, I need to tell you. Not, not in a judgmental way, but because how do, you, how do you help in that situation? I was asked, how do I help? How do I speak to that? And I thought, I just need to speak about the fact that there truly is an eternal life and let the Lord work that out among them, for them. And so, you know, the answer he gives is about the sense of identity in the resurrection uh, for us. And the answer isn't just about marriage. And I do get that asked, asked that often. It's like, will I know my husband or my wife in heaven. And let me kind of answer it this way. First off, yes, you will know people in eternity. I mean, otherwise, why would Jesus answer God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Why would they appear uh, in the transfiguration moment? Why would Jesus in his resurrected form appear to Paul and Paul know exactly who he is? There's something about knowing people other than just our physical connections and forms. You are more than that. I'll give you a case in point. Uh, yesterday, I went to a reunion with some college friends, some guys that had been instrumental in my life, walked in the room uh, for the reunion, and um, it was really nice. I hadn't seen some of them for over 30 years, and that really nice phrase, you haven't changed a bit, was uttered, right? Man, we were definitely, we're squidgier, and we don't look exactly like we did in college days. That's the truth. Just, just me. But um, uh, no, right? You can say no, right? I don't. But they, they, here's the thing. I still knew them. I mean, it, was, it didn't take long at all. We had name tags, but I didn't have to look at them. I know their stories. I know their voices. I know their laugh. I knew them. And the one's like one of my best friends, Danny. Man, when I hugged him, I wanted to hug him. He's huge. I just picked him up off the ground, right? And it felt just like the hug we gave one another 37 years ago. So we know people more than by the relationships that we have here. It is this living with one another that lasts beyond the grave that Jesus is talking about. Now, the marriage example is easy. In, in the best of marriages, there is honesty, intimacy, acceptance, forgiveness, grace extended, and your marriage partner will know you more than anybody else on the face of the earth will know and love you anyway, right? That's the intent of it. It doesn't always work that way. I'm just going to say it doesn't always work that way because, well, we're not perfect, right? You may be, but your spouse isn't. 
okay? But that's another joke, y'all. But, but here's the thing. Eternity isn't about just having one really close relationship, but about having the closest of all relationships of grace and joy and truthfulness and love with everyone that enters eternity through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I, I don't know about you, is, you know, in the best of marriages, you can feel lonely and unknown. In the best of friendships, you can feel misunderstood. But can you imagine spending eternity with all of those in the presence of God who know you just for who you are and think you're pretty incredible because you are a saved saint through the shed blood of Jesus just like them? I think we could get something done. And I think the relationships would be joyful. Don't believe me, listen to the word of God. Revelation 21, speaking of the heavenly city, says the city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light. The lamb, God, is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. Remember, you had to close the gates of the city because night times when the bad guys came out. But the gate stayed open, verse 27, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. This isn't about being exclusive. This is about inviting whosoever will may come. Last thing, very quickly, Jesus cuts through the red tape of hundreds of laws and leaves only two as he aces this exam about how should we live. It's an answer about relationships. I leaned into it a while ago, first with God. Our vertical transcendent uh, relationship with God is one that we have this opportunity, this invitation to love him with all that we have. That means this. I don't know how you value what you have, but apparently it's all God wants. You don't have to go get something somewhere else from somewhere else, borrow another personality, another brain, another brawn. You don't have to do any of that. You don't have to get another heart from anybody else. You just love God with all you have. Heart, soul, mind, strength. Not someone else's, yours. And then... To spread it out, love others around you as you would love yourself. I mean, the greatest math of this is if each one of us only loved ourselves the most, one person would love you. But if we loved others as much as we loved ourselves, well, you can do the math. I like the second option because I'm not that great at loving myself sometimes. I can wake up and know quickly what's unlovable about me. But when a kind word is said, when an encouraging act occurs, when an embrace happens, love. So that's it. That picture that you see there is one I took in Jerusalem outside the temple, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre of uh, uh, a Jesus reenactor. He's eating yogurt for some reason. I don't know what brand. I tried to zoom in and see what kind Jesus liked. And he's talking to a Syrian Coptic priest there. And I wish I could lean in and hear their conversation. I mean, it probably was just about worldly things. I don't know, like, what brand of yogurt do you like? But the picture struck me of the image of Christ talking with these there. And just saying, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven. It's close. And today, it's incredibly close, and you're incredibly close to it. Each day, we are closer to heaven. And we get to live like we're there. But sometimes we don't. Imagine you load the family up, and you're going to the greatest resort you could ever possibly imagine going to. I I don't know. Maybe it's a a great lodge, or maybe it's some... uh, 
some amusement park. I don't know what it is. And you arrive there and you find the parking lot and you pull up and you get in a spot and you just go, all right, trip's over, we're done. Looks good from here. You wouldn't do that. You would get up. You'd go through the gates. You'd experience everything there is to offer. Let us do the same with our faith in Christ, our relationship with God and one another, our opportunities to serve in the world, to make the most of it each day and not remain buckled in the car, but instead abandon ourselves as followers of Christ. Jesus says to the teacher, you are not far from the kingdom of God. I'm amazed in the text, no one asks, how do I get all the way there? You get there by acknowledging Jesus Christ as the Son of God who died on the cross for your sin. You abandon yourself by believing in Him for salvation and not your good works. And you commit all that you have, your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength in saying, Jesus, I am yours. Jesus. 